It is the last Sunday night of the month for those that are attentive. You know that we cover a or talk about at least a little bit about a hymn on the last Sunday night of the month and then apply it as best that I can for whatever we're going to cover. I feel like so far in the first two months, because of being gone a couple of weeks and being sick, I feel like my times are out of whack. But this is the one lesson that I prepared that actually fits in the time frame that it's supposed to be. But um, the song that we're singing tonight, or that we're going to focus on tonight, we actually have not sung yet. Uh, that is on the screen right there, When We All Get to Heaven. I, <clears throat> normally, I, I ask, I'll be quite forthright here, I didn't ask Kevin if he could sing this one. I texted him, I think, Monday night and said, sing this one uh, on Sunday evening. If I'm not mistaken, I think I'd already plugged it in. He couldn't tell me no. I'd already put it onto the PowerPoint projection before he'd even responded to me. But anyway, Kevin, thank you for singing that. But all the other songs were his choice, and they all sort of fit pretty well around what we are going to talk about this evening. Um, one of my favorite things about doing the hymns is not so much the material, which is fine, but I also like to find out a little bit about the person who wrote this as well. I believe this song is number 853 in your songbook, When We All Get to Heaven. And if you look there at the bottom in particular, you'll see that the words were written by a Eliza Edmonds Hewitt, okay? By different things that I've read, she was sometimes referred to as E.E. E. Hewitt, sometimes referred to as Lizzie Hewitt. Um, I was thinking about dad talking about how that when he was doing genealogy for our family, some of the people is the same person, but their name was spelled, if they lived through 10 censuses, their name was spelled different in all 10 of the censuses. So sometimes those old names, uh, there's a little bit of a uh, little fluctuation uh, on those. But she was born in Philadelphia in 1851. It's 1851. And after graduation from high school, she became a school teacher. However, not long after this lady had began teaching school, she developed a spinal condition, which cut short her teaching career and unfortunately made her a shut-in for a long period of time. As you can imagine, being shut in like that at a relatively young age and being deprived of an opportunity to do what you had went to school for and prepared for would be really difficult. And so after a while of being shut in, what I read from her was that she began to study English literature on her own kind of makes sense. You're not going to be able to work uh, the way you would like to, but this would allow you to read and to be able to learn more and study more or whatever. And so as she starts reading and studying, she felt it, the, the thing that I read said that she felt a need to be useful to her church and began writing poems for the Sunday school department. Now, this notion of Sunday school is something that we take as almost a given today. But the idea of Sunday school was very much a late 1800s idea. We don't have a lot of time to talk about it tonight, but it's very controversial, the concept of Sunday school, because in many ways, Sunday school served as an opportunity for children to be educated in other things as well. You learn how to read and write in Sunday school for a lot of kids. There are churches that did not allow Sunday school. There are deeds that say no Sunday school can be taught in certain churches. And that was something that was, uh, oddly enough, extremely controversial in a lot of different places during the 1800s. But <clears throat> she worked for, or she wrote these poems for the children at the Sunday school department. The church that she wrote them for was the Calvin Presbyterian Church. That's what it's called. Or it's what it eventually became called. It wasn't called that to start with, but it was at the corner of 60th and Master in Philadelphia. West Philadelphia uh, was where it took place. Uh, it's not just around the corner from Overbrook High School. Somebody that knows basketball might know that Wilt Chamberlain 
played at Overbrook High School. If you know anything else about West Philadelphia, that's also where Will Smith from the Fresh Prince of Bel Air went to high school as well from a TV show. I see some people nod, and I know where my age group falls and where it doesn't fall right there. But nonetheless, that church was just right around the corner. It's still there as a building, although it does not exist as a church anymore. It closed in 2017. But a couple of the poems that she wrote, tell me if this sounds familiar. There is sunshine in my soul today. Wrote that poem for little kids in the Sunday school department. More about Jesus would I know. Does that sound familiar? And then tonight, when we all get to heaven. She was writing these for a younger audience. And those are songs that we think about. And for kids, those are good things to hear. But for adults, they're pretty good for us to hear as well. And then tonight, we're going to talk about when we all get to heaven. And each verse of the hymn tells of the joy and the glory of finally getting there. And I feel like for somebody who was suffering from a spinal difficulty, who had been robbed of the ability to be able to do what she really wanted to do as a career, the joy of a future in heaven was one of the most exciting things for her to look forward to. Let's talk a little bit, though, about each hymn. If you've got your book, you can look at it. Our songbook only lists three verses. There are more verses than just three, but I'm only focusing on the, excuse me, the three verses that we see on page 853. The first verse that we see says, sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace in the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. And so there's a praise for the love and grace that we have of Jesus. And so I think that that love is certainly worthy of praise. Think about what we praise. What do you praise from time to time? Well, things that you might be encouraged by, things that you might be excited by. You might praise something, but there are things that are sometimes difficult to praise. It's difficult to say enough how much something means to you. In many ways, this love of Jesus, which would be worthy of our praise, was in many ways immeasurable. See, the things that are immeasurable, they're hard to really put a hard number on. I can take this little clicker here and we can measure this. We know exactly how long it is, exactly how thick it is, exactly how much it weighs. And if this weighs a half a pound and you say it weighs five pounds, you're just wrong. We can actually measure this. But how do you measure love and praise from somebody? From Not just from Jesus, but from anybody. Well, it's really hard to measure what it would be. And it's even harder for us to measure the love and praise of Jesus. In Ephesians chapter 3, if you want to turn there, starting in verse 17, <coughs> Ephesians 3 and 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. See, what we see there, and what Paul writes there to the Ephesians, is those measurable things that we can't necessarily measure. We know how tall someone is. We know how, so much, how much someone weighs. Those are the things they do at the doctor's office. But he says that you're not necessarily going to know those kinds of things when you think about the love, but we're rooted and grounded in that love and we know that that love of Christ passes knowledge. See, it's not a mathematical formula. Because if we were to say, well, I'm only supposed to love this much, then what's my encouragement to love anymore? Do you remember when they asked how often you were supposed to, uh, how often you were supposed to forgive somebody? Well, they say 70, seven, seven times and 70 times seven. And I know it, it's, well, if we're not careful, we fall into the math problem and we know exactly what the answer is and there's no wiggle room. See, there's not a lot of grace in math. Math is a hard focus. It has to equal this amount. But when we think about the love and grace of Christ, there's a lot of wiggle room that's there as well. Jesus gives us some idea of how of this. So in John chapter 15 and verse 13, I'd say you probably know this verse when he says that greater love has no one, right? Well, that's what Jesus did for us. That he laid down his life. The thing is, there's not really 
demands that kind of love. I mean, we can demand, but we in the sense that I need you to do this for me. But we don't really deserve that kind of love at all. Think about it for a second. Romans 3, we read that all are sinners, right? And so all of us are sinners. And as sinners, we all would deserve some kind of punishment. What does Romans 6.23 say that the wages of sin is? It's death, right? And so that's what our punishment then should be. And so salvation for us is undeserved. Think about that for a second. We don't deserve salvation. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, we read, But for by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourself, but rather what? We read that it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And so we don't really deserve it. We haven't done anything to earn it, but we have that opportunity for it. That's not unconditional. Matthew 7 and verse 21, we read, Not everyone who says to me, what? Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. So it's a two-way street, right? We have to hold up our end of the deal as well. But there's a sense of praise for his love and his grace. Verse 2. While we walk the pilgrim pathway, clouds will overspread the sky. But when traveling days are over, not a shadow, not a sigh. I want you to think about this for just a second. The song here describes us as pilgrims. I want you to think about what it means to be a pilgrim. For most of us, our mind is probably going to go back to what? Thanksgiving, right? We're going to go back to the people. Some of y'all got a black hat with a buckle on it right now. That wasn't true, by the way. People, all the pictures you see of pilgrims today that none of that's what first if you walked into if you got off a boat with a hat that tall you'd been shot the first minute but anyway they though that's very that's that's either here or there sometimes the history teacher comes out but think about these people that are pilgrims okay and they got on a boat on the opposite side of the ocean and said we are going to go across the water and just kind of see what happens Really, everything that I've read about the pilgrims, the only thing that they truly had with them was the hope that God was with them. They were pretty conceited, to be honest with you. They thought that they were God would protect them and they wouldn't protect anybody else. But you got to be a little conceited to get on a boat and say, where are you going? Over there. And they say, what's over there? It's like, we're about to find out. All right? So when you land right there, in many ways, they are a pilgrim. Well, the Bible describes Christians in that same way as well. In this song, while we walk the pilgrim pathway, this notion here, we don't necessarily know where we're going. See, that path gets a little bit wobbly from time to time, right? We know where we're trying to go to, but does everything always work out smoothly? No, sometimes we get a little distracted. Sometimes we fall off a little bit. Sometimes things fall in the way. A big tree falls down and that detours your path along the way. Well, to be a pilgrim is to sort of make that travel along the way. In Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20, we read, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we are also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. See, those pilgrims, those people from those early people that came over and started the first Thanksgiving and all that, they were citizens of England. But they had lived a while in the Netherlands, and they moved to the United States, or what would become the United States. They were sort of all over the place. Well, if we're not careful, we're the same way, right? Like, where am I a citizen of? Well, I'm a citizen of Lancaster, Garrett County. I'm a citizen of Kentucky. I'm a citizen of the United States. That's where I pay my taxes to, right? But those entities are not guaranteed to exist, right? Those entities may not last forever. Towns go bankrupt. States well, uh, countries can be overtaken. These places that we are claim, oh, this is my entity, well, it may not always be there. Our citizenship should not be focused on here because what will happen? Things will change. Kevin, I guarantee you that if you had said a year ago, Bethany, do you think you'll be living in Texas in a year? What would the answer have been? Probably no. Probably would have been a lot. Why? I, I don't understand. Why would I do that? And now that's where she lives. Things can change. The only constant is where our citizenship should be focused on and that's heaven. That's the one constant that we'd have right there. We can't get too comfortable where we are. Think about that for a second. <clears throat> How many of you know people, or maybe yourself, who have lived in the same house for 40 years? 
Virgil was telling me before church this evening that he was looking through some old stuff, and he said he looked at his watch and said, ah, it's time to go to church. He said he'd lost track of what time it was. But he said he was looking for a picture from his senior year at Lancaster High School in 1946. Well, I'm guessing, Virgil, you got a lot of stuff in your house, right? There's a lot of things that you can look for there within. If we're not careful, we get too comfortable. We got all this stuff. This is where all my stuff is. But we can't get too comfortable on earth, right? Because if you know people who've lived on earth, you also know people that have died on earth. And you know people that have died far too soon or that have died because of instances that weren't necessarily their fault or whatever it might would be. First John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, we read, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, what's the Bible say here right here? The lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father but of this world. And the world is, doing, is passing away and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides. When we say that our citizenship is in heaven, it's because that's the one stable. That's the one constant, not anything that's right here. There should be a longing for this true home, wherever it might be. You ever heard the saying, home is where the heart is? You ever heard that? You ever said that? Maybe something, Maria, I bet you was thinking about that. About, I don't know, week four of that seven-week trip, Maria was probably thinking, home is, home is where the heart is. I'm glad you remembered how to get back to Kentucky. I uh, was starting to get a little bit worried about you right there. But Paul wrote something similar to the Colossians in chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Look with me here. Paul said, if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, for Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. What he's saying right there is our focus shouldn't be here, but that's where it always is, but rather it should be on things above. The same sort of thing here. Home is where the heart is. Well, home is not Pennsylvania or New York or Florida if we're on vacation or uh, you know Texas or wherever it might would be. Home is where we sort of make it, right? Well, this is our passing home. And I might move from one place to another to another, but home where our heart is should be in heaven. Home should be where the Lord is. Paul said again in Philippians chapter 1, verses 21 to 23, we know all of these verses. You're not hearing anything new right here. He said, for me to live is Christ, but what? To me to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet what shall I choose? I cannot tell. And so what he's saying right there is he said, if I live on, there's going to be something good come from it. There is benefit that will come from me living on. But he says, if I could choose, I don't know what I would choose. Verse 23, for I'm hard pressed between the two, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. It's not unlike what we talked about this morning, right? Sometimes we're faced with good choices on both sides. Paul's faced with good choices right there as well. He said, if I live on, I'm going to keep preaching, teaching, writing, working. But if I die, I could go home to heaven to where my citizenship actually is. Third verse. Let us then be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day, just one glimpse of him in glory will the toils of life repay. I get to have this conversation quite often at work. And it's only because there's like four of us that all are in rooms beside each other. And the thing that has happened is, is that over time, some of these positions have changed. And so it's me and two girls and a guy. And just because the way it works out, I am the longest tenured person of those four. I am the oldest of those four. I have taught the longest of those four people. And so ever so often I get to say in eight years when I can retire, and I like to say it every now and then because the disgust that just hits them, because I see them doing the math and they're like, well, it's more than eight for me. And so it's probably more than eight for me too, but I like to say it anyway. But whenever they, whenever we think about that, you think, wow, you know, with any job, the toil, the work becomes sort of tedious, right? Even if we like our job, sometimes it sort of bogs us down, 
just a little bit. Well, the reality is for Christians, sometimes it's the same way. I don't mean it in a negative sense, but we toil on earth as Christians. And one of the things that we love is that whenever something good happens at our job, we're like, man, I wish that happened more, but it usually doesn't, right? It's usually only the bad things. Well, as Christians, it would be nice if everything sort of worked out perfectly all the time. Is that how it works? Obviously not. There's always negatives. And so sometimes we can describe that uh, as being our toiling. But we are, the Bible tells us that we are stewards of what God has left to us. James said all good and perfect gifts come from God uh, through Christ. And so what's required first of a steward? We'll go to 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and look at verses 1 and 2. We read, let us let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. That's the most important thing, right? If you are left in charge of something, the biggest thing, the most important thing is to do what is asked of you. You know, if your job is to take care of the house while people are on vacation and the house burns down, that's kind of a strike against you, right? You didn't hold up your end of the deal. Well, as Christians, if our task that has been left of us is to be Christ-like and act like Christ, then our task has to be fulfilled. But that's difficult. That's laborious. That's a toil if there ever was. It's a difficult thing to do. And sometimes we think, well, I don't know when I'm going to be paid for this. We think about it financially, right? One thing we can almost guarantee is that every other Friday that paycheck comes from the job, right? And you say, well, you know, what's difficult? You know, the job, sometimes these people make me mad. I don't like it. But I know I get on Friday, I get paid. And it makes everything better. When do we get paid as Christians? Well, if we think about it as like a paycheck, we don't, right? We don't get like a couple thousand dollars in our hip pocket at the end of the week and say, boy, it was worth it. But our toil is working towards something that's much, much later. And sometimes it's sort of that deferred compensation, right? You sort of defer that money back to another time, maybe in a job. Well, for us, we're repaid with small things here on earth, but our final, our final payment is that in heaven. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Does that make you comfortable? Well, I would like to get paid. I would like to get paid at my job. But I definitely want to be rewarded when this life is over by going to heaven. See, when we think about the song, when we all get to heaven, I, I wanted to put something in here about the idea of what heaven would be like. And I, I've, I've recently finished a book about sort of the history of the afterlife and heaven and hell. And, I, and the more I read, the more I got to thinking, I don't want to put anything in it. Like, we can talk about what, you know, the rich man and Lazarus and all that, but I'm a kind of a firm believer that this notion of heaven and what heaven might be like isn't really found in the Bible. And what I mean by that is this. We don't really find, you know, when we think about the streets of gold and the, that, those are all just sort of descriptors. But I think personally, what I think about heaven and what you think about heaven should be your own personal thought. Whatever you think heaven would look like, let it be that. Because here's the thing, none of us know and nobody has the ability to go and then come back and tell us what it is. And here's the thing. If they could, we wouldn't like it. Because somebody would go and they'd say, this is made out of gold. And he'd say, ah, oh, they should have used silver. You know, that's how people complain about things, right? We fall into that. So I thought about it. I'm going to add that. But I thought, you know what? No, I'm not. I'm going to leave you with that. You go home. And whatever you want heaven to be, let it be that. What's the song say? I'm satisfied with, you know, with, with, uh, the mansion over the hilltop, right? Uh, but, and and a, a little silver and a little gold. I can't remember exactly how the song goes right there. But if we're not careful, we start getting this sort of notion of what heaven should be, and it gets to be material, right? It gets to be material. It's like, oh, man, well, it's got to be bigger than the house. I, well, let's don't worry about that. Let's just know that the work that we're doing, the labor that we're doing, whatever it is that we're doing is not in vain. And whatever heaven is, is far greater than than whatever is right here. Just think about it that way and let that go with you uh, a, a, as we go. Because the repayment is far better than what we can imagine. Here's the thing. The repayment is eternal. And so whatever it is, it's far better than anything that we can have. 
These were pretty inspirational and encouraging words for Sunday school children a century ago, but we sing the song every couple, of, every couple of months here as well. She wrote these words in 1898. That's 125 years ago, and they still work today. And I would think 125 years from now, they'll still be effective as well. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. The second part of the course is what's best. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. And that will be the most encouraging thing. Whatever we can do for you, anything that we can do for you, any way that we can help you get there as well. It takes a little bit of work. It takes a little bit of toil and suffering. But our hope is, is that when this life is over, we'll be able to get there and it'll be all the more worth it as a result. If there's anything we can do for